Hello, before I start the show, I would just like to bring your attention to a merch pre-sale I have happening right now. I know a lot of you have been asking especially for the gold shirts to come back. And I decided to do a little pre-sale. Um, the shirts are expected to ship in mid-November, so you will get them before the holidays. So now's a great time to snag one up if you'd like it. So here's the gold one. It's the classic Fazio Electric shirt. And then we have the El Camino Marshall Stack shirt. Uh, both of these are available and they'll be available through November 1st, so get your orders in. I'll include a link to order the shirts in the description below. Thank you guys so much for your support. Hey guys, Colleen here. I'm with my friend Brian Keyhue. He owns Round and Wound Studio in North Hollywood. And at this studio they transfer analog to digital media. So we're going to hear Brian talk a little bit more about that. But I would like to start by hearing about your musical beginnings. I grew up in San Bernardino, which is a large town just outside of L.A., about an hour away. Um, a big, big town. But um, a musical family, sort of. My parents were amateur musicians who sang and played some piano, so I had the lessons and things. Mm -hmm. Got into guitar from learning it from my sister. And then my brother took up some drums and I learned to play those too. So we all had interest in music without really doing much other than hobbyist stuff. Mm. And then eventually I started getting serious. I took guitar lessons, piano lessons, and some music theory. And at the same time I was into electronics, kind of curious about it at least. And I do remember when I was a kid like opening up the home stereo and finding out that one of the speakers was disconnected, whatever that meant. I didn't know. Yeah. It was like two wires one of them's loose let's do it so being unafraid is probably one of the keys to our like our existence is like curious but also a little bit unafraid to mess with things so how did you get into tape were you as you were growing up and playing music with your siblings were you learning how to record and use tape like a lot of musicians and people at the time there was cassette four tracks and also reel to reels a little better quality but much more expensive and I started with the amateur stuff, messing with that layering sounds. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to do now, but it was a lot harder back then. And I, I believe that that was a good challenge to learn about. And then uh, working with friends, somebody might own an eight track, little reel to reel, which is fancy if you're a kid, but also uh, great learning stuff. How do you do drums in one track? You right. know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's no limitations. And I, I think that might be harder to learn that way. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a thousand paint colors, it would be more confusing to learn to paint than if you start with a pencil and a piece of paper. Absolutely, you know? yeah. So um, tell me about what you guys do here at the studio and how long you've been doing that here. This is North Hollywood, so we're just over the hill from regular Hollywood and most of L.A. Um, the Valley, we call it, and the Valley is a big space where real estate is cheaper. So there's a lot of production spaces, movie making, uh, there's literally, I think, four studios, music studios, on this side of my block, wow. and there's three on that block, mainly because the property is cheaper in North Hollywood. You asked about tape recorders. That was where I started with those things, but I never really gave it up. Uh, analog is a thing, whether you like synthesizers or tube amps or those kinds of things. There was a bigger divide, though. When digital was new, it wasn't as good. Mm -hmm. And I heard the difference. A lot of people did, but digital had benefits and opportunities. So most people jumped into digital audio workstations, recording, whether it be Logic or Pro Tools and things. And I kept my old tape machines around, kept using them. And for a long time, that was like what made me different was I still worked with tape. And I still believe in it, although I don't think it's necessary. It's sure fun. And if you only had even, let's say, eight tracks to work with and record a punk band, that's a great challenge because some of the greatest records are made that way. If Hendrix can make his records on eight track, you should be able to make a great record if you're any good. But in having those tape machines, especially in that period of the 90s going away, 2000s was when pretty much everybody went digital. Mm -hmm. I was getting calls from Warner Brothers and other people specifically to play old tapes, and they wanted to hear even not for a transfer, just to hear an old tape, what's on it. And so we brought the tapes here. We had 16-track, 8-track, 24-track, etc., and we could go through tapes. And Warner Brothers has a fantastic warehouse full of tapes, not far from me. 
And it's got the Hendrix, it's got Madonna, Green Day, Fleetwood Mac is in there. It's a fantastic place to visit, but it's very private. <laughs> and yet they would bring all these Eagles tapes over and go, let's go listen through the Eagles to see if there's any material we could release. Oftentimes people will bring us an old tape, usually multi-track, so it could be eight or 24 tracks, and we bake it in our special ovens. That just makes it playable again. And then we can usually transfer it to digital, but part of my job, which still remains creative, is getting to mix those projects. And since I have a lot of history knowledge and a lot of study of different types of music, and also you know, the way they mix drums for jazz is different than the drums in metal bands, mm -hmm. I love all that stuff. So I, I know how to make it kind of work. If I'm doing a Pantera thing or Duke Ellington, we have had those opportunities. But mainly I get to at this point do transfers through our company and then I get hired to do creative mixing um, if there are outtakes, if there are tracks people haven't heard, like the Fleetwood Mac Rumors project. We went through all the tapes and there's a different version of Dreams and there's another version of Dreams and so we'll mix all three of those in different stages and then they pick out which one they want on sure. the box set. So I get to be very creative uh, on my own mostly with a producer guiding us and then it is different than people who just master, because mastering is when you take a finished mix, make it sound its best. Um, those are other people that work for Warner Brothers and the artists, but I get to do the mixing part, which to me is more, more creative. creative. Sure, that's really fun. The and I like to, uh, if we're working on something from the 80s, we, don't, we all know how the 80s sound, <laughs> or even the 70s, but you try to make it a bit more timeless. Uh, if in the 80s they had a big loud snare drum with a bunch of reverb, We'll still do that, but take it back like 10%, 15% less reverb. So it still sounds 80s, but the, even the artist will say, ooh, that sounds a little better than I remember it. Mm -hmm. So we were going through a major, major artist recently that had MTV hits. And I think when you take all the gunk off of it, the tracks were really good players. The programming was good. The singing was good. And it was just layered in choruses and reverbs. And our mix was mostly to, to return it to a more timeless sound. So when they put it out, even the artist feels good about an 80s recording. Mm -hmm. Tell me about a few of your favorite projects that you've been a part of. Um, I grew up and I'm a big fan of Fleetwood Mac. Many people are, and I've talked about that briefly here, but they have so many records and different style periods, but it's great because when you strip it all back, they're usually just a few people in the room. So what an honor and what great fun to get to go through those things they just released a live rumors that we did live at the forum so it's a, a mix and we mixed it without any tuning we didn't fix anything and it's not perfect but they are so good at what they did and capturing that live without repairing without tricking things it's great we're respecting how good they were but also realizing yeah we could have tuned the vocals but it, you don't want to it's they were great mm -hmm. Those artists don't need it. What about the Woodstock projects? Woodstock is a fascinating one. In the vaults at Warner Brothers, they have these high shelves, hundreds and thousands of tapes, but one corner was just Woodstock. And for years, we'd go buy the Woodstock tapes, and you'd see Jimi Hendrix and Canned Heat and Joan Baez and all these tapes, and multiple tapes for, like, The Who, multiple tapes for Sly Stone wondering what they sounded like. The original Woodstock film came out with about a song per band. Some people didn't even make it in the movie or on the subsequent album. And then there was even a Woodstock 2 later where they put out a second song by some of the bands, but there's a whole Who concert in there. There's a whole Sly concert. So oh, yeah. I love that stuff. Johnny Winter, Can't Heat is amazing. Creed's Clearwater, S many of these bands like were at their peak. Janis mm -hmm. Joplin, 69, Grateful Dead. So the world's most famous concert had never been heard. And then in 20, uh, oh God, it was ages ago, <laughs> we started going through it for the 40th anniversary and it was pretty much completed. And then they had legal troubles getting it all to come out. Oh, Each band had, you know, lawyers and managers and infighting, but then it came up on the 50th and they said, we think it's time to really push this through. The 50th is gonna be the time when those who are still alive can remember it or those who remember the impact. So we mixed uh, all of it years before, but given that technology had moved forward, some of the things that were problems, like a bad buzz or a bad hum, I could deal with in software now oh, that we couldn't okay. do when we were just analog. 
and so we got to mix all of Woodstock. It's a giant mega box, and unfortunately, it's sold out, but I believe there's CD versions. There's definitely a best of, and there's definitely reduced versions. Probably people have it out there, oh, but sure. there are full shows, and we mixed it pretty live, not much fixing at all, taking out a bad guitar noise or something, but we left the tuning in, the talking, mm -hmm. and even the announcements after Santana walks off stage, they let the tape run for 20 minutes, and you hear the helicopters come in and people talking about asthma medicine and losing things in the dirt and stuff. We left all that in. Wow. You're really hearing some behind the scenes. It feels yeah. like being there. Almost. Right. Yeah. So it's one of those exciting projects, the biggest concert ever as far as impact on the world had never really been heard, which is weird. All right. Tell me a little bit about the day in the life here at the studio, some projects that you enjoy, some projects that you don't necessarily enjoy, mm -hmm. challenges all of that fun stuff every day somebody calls and said i have some old tapes and we say all tapes are old by this point <laughs> it's uh, there are almost no new tapes in the world but it's true somebody has something and uh we try to cover all the different formats most of our work is mom and pop stuff so local families and people might have their kids piano recital or my dance troupe all our background music or your band from the 80s did some demos now that people have computers at home, they often want to take their old music and rework it, you know, make it sound better. But we've had, like, one guy brought us a tape, and it was his mother. She was not going to live long, and she wanted to explain to him before she passed on. And he was a little two-year-old child. And she recorded her life history on a tape, and he'd never heard it before. So he brought me this tape and said, can you test this? I don't know if there's anything on it. And then I started playing it back, and a woman started speaking in Spanish, and he started crying because this woman was his mother who was telling him, this is my life before I, I knew you, and you were not old enough to know. Wow. Fantastic moment. We had some NASA tapes of moon shots come in, and I just realized that they probably don't have analog tape recorders at NASA anymore. I'm sure some of them and most of them had been done long ago, but they may not even find where their transfers went to. Mm -hmm. So... We've had NASA tapes and stuff when the National Hot Rod Association, which I think NHRA is still cool, they were trying to decide, and I'm listening to these tapes go down, they're traveling across the country because drag racing used to be done in the middle of the street or on the country roads. People were dying, so they said, if we set up an actual drag strip in each town with safety harnesses and rules, gas shutoff if your car crashes, things like that, we can prevent all these deaths that are happening, mm -hmm. but you have to allow people to drag race in your town. And all these sheriffs were fighting them. It's on tape, it's great. Wow. The first years in the 50s, they were saying drag racing is gonna happen, but let's get it off the streets. And so there's this whole audio document of going across the country, bringing drag racing out to becoming a professional sport. Really, most of the businesses, normal people, they've got a closet, Christmas tapes, my, you know, recordings of the radio when I was a kid with my favorite DJ. That's fun stuff, too. Totally, we love it. Yeah. So we get to go through. And some tapes are a pain, but most of them are really quite good. I'm real pleased. I think that the best medium we have is still paper because I know I can hold up Egyptian paper from 2,000 years ago and read it. But tape is pretty good. It's probably hard drives I don't trust too much. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> um, what are some challenges that present themselves? I assume a lot of it has to do with like degradation of the tape itself. And how can you potentially save those tapes? If you have an old tape and you splice together two parts, you actually cut the tape and you put some sticky tape over it. It's the sticky tape that's the problem. As we're rewinding the tape, it comes apart. We have to rebuild. If they did 50 splices to like make a mix in the old days, not often, but sometimes, Every one of those has to be rebuilt and reattached mm -hmm. as we play the tape. Before we can just push play and actually do the hour-long transfer, we spend an hour preparing that tape. And that's the worst-case scenario, but most tapes, if they're professional, really good quality. We've had tapes come in with mold, tapes that were underwater, and they still played. Wow. Not perfectly, but that's why I'm so fond of tape still. As a storage medium, it may not be perfect sound, but you'll at least hear almost everything. Sure. Our main struggle is the machines themselves. They are old. I would say the newest machine in here is 30 years old. Um, and many of them are 50. And you've got rubber parts, belts, hoses, things like that that go in there like a car. Issues to deal with. Um, we're constantly buying machines, sometimes just for parts. 
We have one or two great repairmen who are either experienced or unafraid to take on a <laughs> weirdo box like a wire recorder. And keeping them running is why normal people just couldn't do this. I do have these machines, but probably 15, 20% of them will need repair this year. This is our main transfer room for Round and Wound. Mostly analog machines, but different types and different kinds. We have so many tape machines, we actually roll them in and out at different times because there's, I think, 12 or more in the, in the storage outside here, just that you can't fit them all into one room. Yeah. But uh, constantly working, we have um, ADATs, which is the Alesis Digital Tapes. We just got a bunch of those from Jay Graydon, the famous guitar player, who we did his transfers, and in return, he gave us the machines. Wow, that's a good deal. Really good for everyone. Um, Tascam had digital tapes called... DA88 and then other versions of that format. Those are hard to find working now. So we have, I think 10 or 12 of those machines, but you never know which ones are gonna be the best and we try to keep them rolling. Digital audio tape, DAT tapes are here. Quite a few of those and of course analog cassettes. Everybody's got cassettes somewhere in a closet. And even these strange ones, which are, I love these machines, Akai 12 track, analog recording on a video tape format and that was my dream when I was young they came out and you're like wow you get 12 tracks that's incredible right. but uh, for those people who were kind of amateur or maybe making low-level records they were pretty cool there might be just a few of those working in all of America so we get tapes from Denmark and France for those machines we've had tapes from all over the world because we love keeping ours running this corner is a little bit more amateur hour 8 track and 16 track Fostex and Tascam, those companies really supplied people with their home demo formats, usually half inch or quarter inch, etc. There's even a 24 track Tascam that was very unusual. I wish I'd known about that. That would have been an amazing machine back in those days. And we have various analog formats, especially the, the quarter inch tape, which is small tapes like this one here, is what you would see the most often. This one has nicely been stored in someone's bucket here. <laughs> But um, it's a family tape, I think, this one. So you can see that it wasn't stored well. It's going to play fine. And they sometimes come with a box, but there's no information on it. What speeds? Is it four track, two track? We don't know until we play with it. So we can probably rescue it. It's not a big problem. We do so much of quarter inch tape that it's probably the most popular format. If you're mixing ACDC, mixing Led Zeppelin, Mixing anybody from the heyday of music, even the Beatles, is quarter-inch tape on the mixes. And in the 80s, they came out with half-inch mixing tape. So everybody nowadays, really, if you're doing analog, half-inch tape recorders that do mixing have become very valuable. But they're really abandoning all these quarter-inch machines as not as good. But if you've heard Dark Side of the Moon, you've heard Miles Davis, that is quarter-inch tape, and it sounds fantastic. So... I think a lot of people are missing the point when they don't buy a quarter-inch machine. If you want to mess around with analog, buy one of the millions of quarter-inch machines out there. They're not the coolest, but they work great usually. And then we have uh, in back here where Darren, Darren Edwards is studio manager. And we have 24-track Studer tape machines, an old 3M 16-track from the 70s. There's even a cool little one inch 16 track, which is a rarer format, but we need to keep that around in case people use it. We have racks of noise reduction in case the tapes have been printed with noise reduction on them. You need to play it back with that kind of stuff. And so you set it up for the tapes. We like to usually do a transfer without it and sometimes add it later. It all depends. Um, but sometimes if it's just printed on the tape, we'll just set it up so it sounds good and do it. But that's another one of those factors. If you just said, oh, I want to transfer tapes for people and you buy a nice quarter inch machine, sometimes they have noise reduction. Sometimes they have other issues. So we deal with all of that. We have stayed away a little bit from computer recording stuff. I think there's a big market for out there if people have early sound designer files, old Pro Tools, um, the early days of logic and things to be able to pull up those sessions that would take a person that lived through that world, which I didn't do. So I'm not going to jump into that. But using SCSI drives and those formats from the middle period, I was still analog. I'm still analog now. Mm -hmm. So that's the world I know. And yet there's probably a great market for people that can pull up vintage floppy drives, vintage hard drives uh, that most computers don't talk to nowadays. I think that would be the next step mm -hmm. is 
kind of a middle ground, although I wouldn't want to live in that world. Tape machines to me are much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. I'm not very computer savvy at all. So my brain understands analog, and that's pretty much it. Very and even digital stuff. Even as we find tape machines, there every week there's a challenge. It might be a tape that is recorded, and they change the speed in the middle of it. Or it goes from two-track to four-track. We need to take it off, put it on a different machine, realign that machine, transfer it, and then decide how to give the customer those hodgepodge of files. Sure. They don't even know what's on the tape half the time. I would say less than 20%, 30% have full writing on them, and almost none of them are officially done well by a professional studio. Those are the fantastic tapes when they're labeled and spliced and beautifully done we know what's going to come off them and they always play well but but we have a box over here one of my friends brought by a huge pile of home tapes so there might be some studio work in there there might be some family recordings but that is many many hours of work many many hours of listening but when they were at home people played with the speed they record a baseball game at slow speed then the child's first communion at high speed and then a TV show and backwards. And so <laughs> we could spend hours going through one of those tapes to get it right. All right, Darren. So tell me about how long you've worked here with Brian and what your day-to-day -day is like here. I've been here for about almost seven years. Day-to-day, -day, we get a lot of tapes, all different formats. Frequently, we don't know what's on the tapes. Mm -hmm. People don't even know what's on the tapes most of the time. Um, are there any projects that have been memorable for you to work on? Yeah, a, a lot of great stuff. Um, you know, a lot of the obvious, the the big bands and sure. big music acts that we've done. When we get the multi-tracks, the fun of it is, if it's 24 track or 16 track, you know, two inch, we can um, solo tracks, can just listen to the guitar track on its own. That's so cool. You know, the yeah. drums on their own and things like that. So if it's a band you like, you it's really- You can isolate the tracks. You can isolate the tracks, it's really fun. A lot of family tapes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, recordings of people when they were a kid from the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of those. Yeah, everything. Answer machine tapes. Oh, that's, that's a cool one. From the 80s <laughs> and the 90s. Actually, the best tape I ever had, I think, was an answer machine tape. What, what made it the best tape? <laughs> it was um, basically, it was a first call from a daughter to her mother who gave her up for adoption. Whoa. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty it was, intense. It was, yeah, it was like, I had no idea what it was um, when I put it on. Mm -hmm. It was just a little, one of those micro cassettes that you used to put in answer machines. Who brought that to you? Was it somebody in that family? Yeah, somebody from the family. I think they knew, they knew what oh, was yeah, on it, I think. They were aware. Right, right. And, um, but I, I wasn't, and I just dumped put it on, and I was like, wow, wait a minute, this is crazy I feel like last time I was here you guys were telling me about um, somebody in the army or the military who had recordings yeah. there was a lot of um, I think what they used to do um, I think it was during the Vietnam War mm -hmm. they would send little um, tapes back and forth and it, as opposed to like letters it's yeah. recorded recording voice. yeah yeah and they're pretty short, but um, they were pretty amazing from the late 60s, yeah. Yeah, it's so moving. Yeah, a bunch of them. We've had a few things there. We've n I think we've even had a few, um, I think even in the Second World War, they would make these little disc recordings. Is, uh, right, Brian? Yeah. Where you'd go into like a booth and you could record a few minutes of talking oh. and oh. mail them to your family. We actually d did a few of them. They're very crackly and mm -hmm. that, but um, we've had a few and played them. And um, yeah, we've even done uh, wire recordings, which is the wire from the, I think it was, we did a bunch from 1949. And um, those are tough. They are, I won't lie, they're a hassle. Yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine, like, yeah. Yeah. gosh, wire seems like a very finicky yeah. medium. But pretty much everything, everything's covered as you see every... Yeah. Every format, every machine. Do you guys do video at all? Or? Yeah. Um, Hi8, uh, VHS, uh, Mumatic, yeah, a few formats of video, yeah. So if somebody um, wants to get something transferred, is the best way to contact you via telephone or email? What's the best? Either way, yeah, calling's easier. Okay. You know, uh, just... And they'll get to talk to you. Probably, yeah. <laughs> How long does it usually take from some receiving a tape 
to it being finished? That depends, you know. Um, usually within a week, mm-hmm. within five days, I'd say. Um, but sometimes when it gets really busy, it can take longer because we do them um, first come, first serve. Sometimes there's been times where it could take up to three weeks, you know, when it's been crazy busy and stuff. Yeah, which is still very fast, though, for something so niche that you guys do. I mean, I don't know anybody yeah, else it doing be, this it has to be done in real time and uh, pretty much monitored the whole time right, right. You, know, you have so. to be actively listening yeah. as yeah. it's transferring yeah. cool yeah. well thanks for chatting with me darren super cool if my dad is watching this please get the f- the family videos converted he has like the v the um vhs, VHS one that the tape goes into the vhs adapter all right, yeah, I know. So I don't know, but... Yeah, we have the adapter. You do? <laughs> All right, Dad. So among the favorite projects are things up there. I have a Delaney and Bonnie live box set. My favorite band growing up with Black Sabbath, and we've been through quite a few of their records and put out live albums and things like that. Um, I love Alice Cooper band. They're so good. And even through working with their tapes and so forth, there's one I really appreciated it better, how great they were. So we've done some album outtakes and some live things for them too and over there i see the faces there's some pretenders pretenders is such a great band on their first few records especially and digging through that um echo and the bunny men there's the stooges on their first record which is an incredible record and a bunch of ramones because i love punk rock just as much Mm -hmm. but i grew up with my feet in all those camps of like punk rock heavy metal electronic music experimental music acoustic jazz i like all that stuff So I think it's nice to be able to have the chance to work on different styles and and do justice to it. I even see a coasters thing over there, which Mm -hmm. is probably the earliest, 56 to 59, I think. And the coasters were a fantastic vocal group. But hearing them go through take after take live in the studio, they didn't cut their vocals after the drums. They cut them all together. And if the high guy doesn't sing the high note and the low guy didn't sing the low note, they have to do a whole take over again. So it's great to hear people working that hard and the experiences that they have. I love the fly on the wall thing, and I think most audiences now, if I turned up a Thin Lizzy record or Alice Cooper, you'd actually like to hear them talking in the studio as much as you want to hear them play the music. Yeah. We want to be a fly on the wall. Totally. So I think that's, you know, when the Beatles put out the, the recent uh, films of them working in the studio, that's pretty exceptional to have film of that, of a great band working on such well-known music. But we can hear it sometimes, but boy, getting to watch them do it was amazing. All right. Speaking of the Beatles, tell us about the work that you've done with their studio equipment, the book that you wrote about their studio equipment. I'd love to hear about that. A long time ago, like most people in music, I was fascinated with the Beatles recordings, how they did them. Back then, there were no recording magazines, really. There were no, of course, no Internet, but even very few interviews dealt with that side of things. And I wanted to know about drum mics. I wanted to know about compressors and flangers and things. I'd see the great pictures of the Beatles in the studio and what kind of compressor is that? What is that mixing board? And almost nobody knew about it. I mean, almost nobody. Even when the internet was coming out and people already were talking about the Beatles, they were explaining things and people were guessing, but almost none of it was authoritative or right. And I started researching a book that was originally going to be all the sounds, including drum sets and keyboards and guitars and amps and microphones. But that became unwieldy. And also, in the meanwhile, a book did come out about the Beatles instruments. Okay, that made it easier, but still a huge task. And then I met a guy who was working on the same idea from Texas. And I was interviewing one of the old Abbey Road people. He said, oh, there's a guy in Texas doing the same book as you are. And I was like, oh, no. (laughs) But after seven years of working, I was not even close to finishing. And I thought, I'm going to write to this guy and drop my ego for a minute and see if he would be willing to talk about it. And he was really smart, really good guy to him, Kevin Ryan, and also had done his own work. He learned things I didn't know, and I learned things he didn't know. And we knew some stuff that was common. But we realized that, you know, if he puts out a book that's 80% right, and I put out a book that's 80% right, it's better to be 100% there if we can. Combine your notes and your research. Two of us together, it came out with so much better than either of us would have done. Right. Partnership is a fantastic thing. So all of my best work has been working with other people, I think. Totally. Um, It's sitting behind you on the shelf is the recording the Beatles book that came out in 
2006. It is uh, big and heavy. It is very heavy. <laughs> 12 pounds. And we built it, even in the box, it's designed to look like an original Beatles tape box would have looked. A lot of years, Kevin and I spent together going to England, working on things, and we were not known by Abbey Road. We were not known by most of those people from those days, but slowly we won people over with our knowledge and our hopefully helpfulness, and we wrote this intensive book. I mean, even after we finished researching, it took just a year to write it and another year to do the layout and clear the photos and pay for things and, and you know get the graphics ready. And then we did try to shop it to book companies. All the major book companies were interested, but they wanted to make it small and they wanted to make it cheap. And we said, we just spent our lives on this big thing and you want to cut all the arms and legs off it. So we decided to self-publish it, which was never wrote a book before, never did that. <laughs> but luckily, Kevin is quite good at learning things and figuring things out. And we did get to self-publish and have great success. So the book was out for 10 years it sold like crazy, and then we took it out of print uh, after 10 years in order to make it bigger, to, mm -hmm. to new new version. And then we were approached by George Martin's family. They wanted to do a book for him of his orchestra scores. We've been working on that for eight or nine years now. Almost done, but that's a great compliment and a great project, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. I can't wait till we finish it. <laughs> I'll show you a picture of it as it's coming. Uh, almost done. But even today, I worked on it for a few hours before I came to the oh, studio. Wow. That's an amazing project. But we do want to make that book bigger and better. Everybody says, when will it be for sale? I didn't buy one the first time. But we actually want to sell it to you. We want to make it better than it was. But we have to finish this George Martin project first. Super important. And then we're going to spend a year or two on that one to add in. It might be edition. twice as big, I think. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, I know. Backbreaker. Uh, maybe two books is what we're thinking. Two books sure. to put all the new information. Sure. So you're sitting in a chair, by the way. That's oh, uh, yes, this chair. So we'll send you a picture to put up, which is uh, one of the Abbey Road chairs from the 60s. So And there's still quite a few left at the studio. But as you see, they get torn up and ripped up. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if Sting is there or some major classical cellist is sitting on this chair, you don't want a torn up chair. And while we're talking about chairs, since I'm sitting here, yes. My studio partner is Kurt Anderson. Kurt is a great uh, wiring guy, technician, and engineer. But he got this from NBC where he worked. They were throwing these chairs out. And these are from the Elvis comeback special in 68 when he's got his amazing leather jumpsuit on. Elvis even play, pulls one of these chairs up, maybe this one, and plays a song with his guitar. And so the whole band is sitting on them. The audience is sitting on them. And at one point, NBC thought these were ratty and stupid. So they were throwing them out. And he saved quite a few. Some went to Graceland, so they're in their museum. Mm -hmm. But there's even little dolls and toys of Elvis. And then they have a little doll chair of That's these NBC amazing. chairs. Wow. Yeah. So there's very few out there. But these are our, really our coolest things to sit on is an yeah. Elvis chair and a Beatles chair. So how did you guys go about getting some, in, some of the information and doing the research for the Abbey Road book? That was initially, looking back on it, very hard. Um, even finding people... Uh, who were these people that worked on Beatles records? There might be a producer, George Martin, of course. Sometimes, almost never, an engineer listed. But who were the other people that worked in the room? Who were the people from Abbey Road? So buying books, uh, finding interviews and recording magazines, you'd learn a name or two. And then we would search people out, try to reach out to people. But one of the techniques that we learned, Kevin and I, was don't go in with the big B word blazing most of these people if they worked with the Beatles that's all anybody asks about but we were actually interested in that but we were interested more in you as a person working at Abbey Road you did Judy Garland you might have worked with a reggae group you might have worked with a symphony orchestra on the same week tell us about your day tell us about your work and then in doing so they always talk about the Beatles mm -hmm. that will come up naturally but instead of asking if somebody was a famous child star, you don't want to ask about that TV show the first time you meet them. So we talked about Abbey Road. We talked about the history of it. And especially when you're a technical person like you or I, the equipment matters. I mean, if you know what kind of amp that is, what kind of microphone we're using, what kind of console, then it is important for your job. And you remember that stuff, maybe more than what song they were working on. So uh, it was great to talk to the tech people from Abbey Road 
whose names are never written down in most places. They're fantastic people. They're good friends of ours. And they would also connect us to each other slowly. Hey, I'm going to put you in touch with my old friend Timmy or Tommy or whatever. And he lives in Canada or he lives in South America. And then at one point, there's Alan Parsons, who is well known from Abbey Road and his own records. And he said, you're like an Abbey Road dating service. <laughs> but it just reconnecting these people that used to work together in 68 or 64 might not have talked to each other in 50 years. And we put them in the room together sometimes. Yeah. Human memory is tricky. When you ask somebody about the past, it's very tricky to know if that's right or not. Mm -hmm. Your memory could be confused. I'm pretty bad with my own memory, but documents really help. Photographs really help. So we could walk into an interview, hold up a photo. Oh, yeah, that's right. We had this thing on a mic stand for two weeks. I forgot all about it because mm -hmm. it was 50 years ago. And other times people would say, I've never seen that box before in my life, but it's there pictured with the Beatles. Person number 12 finally remembers what it was. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I wanted to give a shout out to DistroKid. They help musicians get their music on streaming platforms and musicians get to keep all of their royalties, which is awesome. We love musician friendly services. Viewers of my channel get 30% off at the link I will post here. And below it is distrokid.com slash VIP slash Vazio. So go check it out and get your music uploaded. Uh, this is my favorite thing in the whole building, actually. This was uh, a man had passed away and his wife was clearing out the house. She had this rusty old clock, RCA, and a couple RCA signs from his collection. This was really beat up and rusted, so I stripped it, redid the metalwork. I found a woman who hand paints signs and we traced out the original letters and repainted the original letters and it works and I love the original neon from 70 years ago still works if you don't know that neon never runs out as long as that tube stays sealed it will work for hundreds of years I did not know that. it just doesn't leak so I like the look of vintage neon too and it has a kind of deco streamlined curve to it so since we're a music place radio tubes and nipper the RCA dog very welcome here when we work so I know you have a great relationship with The Who and you've worked with them for quite a while. So tell me about that. Uh, it came about by accident. And I think it's one of life great lessons is John Lennon, I think, said life is what happens when you're making other plans. Mm -hmm. So my goal was to be a recording engineer and make pop rock kind of commercial records. Um, it sort of worked out, but not quite the same way. But I was working in a music store in L.A. at the time and this older roadie guy kept coming in named Alan Rogan who's a kind of famous roadie worked with Clapton ACDC uh, Joe Walsh Eagles Tom Petty everybody George Harrison etc so he became a good friend and he's a very loud boisterous guy but at one point he just said hey Pete Townsend's coming to near San Diego to play a private show and Pete's gonna play guitar and keyboards solo but he said, I have no clue about keyboards. I need a guy that knows keyboards. And that's one of the things I grew up with. So I, he said, would you do it? And I was like, of course, I'd love to do it. And I went down and met Pete, and we worked on that show. And there were some issues with the keyboards, but I was able to solve them quickly. I didn't cause them, but when they, things break, that's your job is to get them going. And Pete and I got along well. He's one of my favorite writers and favorite performers, too. So uh, a couple years later, I think just a year and a half later, they were starting on their next tour, and John Entwistle passed away of a heart attack the night before the first show. Oh, and so they reformed really quickly with Pino Palladino playing bass, who's fantastic, but very different. And so they decided to come to L.A. to do rehearsals and just had a couple days before their first show ever without him on bass. And they called me and said, can you come help us set up and do things? And then that night they said, well, we're going to go to the Hollywood Bowl do you want to be on stage during the show? And I was like, wow, not only did I get to rehearse with them, now I get to stand on the stage while they're playing. Yeah. This is like a dream come true and so cool. But after the show, the tour manager said, if you want to go on tour, be on the bus in an hour. Oh my God. And I was like, I'll be back. And I went home down the street, packed a bag, canceled all my appointments and went on tour. And it's been 22 years now. Wow. Amazing. So we have worked out at least as a, a, fam a road family. It's probably like any office, sort of, but a little bit more intense because you wake up with all the same people. We have breakfast, lunch, dinner together, work together, and then have a drink and a pizza before we go to bed in the same bus together. It's right. really intense, mm -hmm. but those that's my family. We're all so really close. And the Who crew specifically, 
I think it works with any band, but it's top down, like the way Roger and Pete are. Very funny people, easygoing, a little loose, a little crazy, but also serious about the music. Their crew is the same way too. We all laugh all day long. And most of the people on their team are really badass, serious, high level workers who can also take a joke about themselves sure. and throw a, a cup at somebody's head. And, <laughs> and if things go wrong, you know, you need to solve it. But The Who plays a lot of bad notes every show, and they're still better than most people at putting on a concert. So we've learned that not everything has to be perfect. Not everything has to be taped down and labeled just right. They want to have a good experience, but it's not about being perfect. Right. There you go. What year is that? 52. 1952. It's got like the best patina on the fretboard. Just looks, oh, it looks really good. Call it mint minus condition. Mint, mint minus. minus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the best guitar I've ever played. How long have you had it? Uh, when I moved to LA, I found it in a shop. It didn't say Fender. It had been sanded off. And they were like, we think it's a Fender, we're pretty sure. And they weren't even sure what gear, but I could tell from the parts what it kind yeah. of was. And it wasn't expensive. It was not expensive. Yeah, I sold true. a few guitars that very night. I sold a few guitars and ran back to the store with cash and bought it. But um, if everything else goes up in flames, I'll be running out the door with this guitar. Yep. What I find amazing is that Leo Fender did not play guitar. And I talked to a guy that worked at the factory with him long ago. And I was like, how would he do amps mm -hmm. how would he adjust and design his stuff and he goes put a guitar on the table and go <laughs> and i was like wow so he's doing an e minor suspended seventh uh all the time and if you make that sound good maybe that's a weird chord to me and he'd literally it would drive people crazy they said <laughs> when he did that but that's how he was dialing in the tone controls and yeah. the gain of stuff but everybody yeah. has their own weird ways of hearing and listening yeah, in fact, that would be a good question for you. When you're trying out, you play, so you obviously can do it that mm -hmm. way. I definitely will um, play just single notes, hear the sustain of the amp, listen for rattles, listen for distortion where there shouldn't be, and make sure everything's working. But then I like to test, you know, with actual guitar playing just to hear the full effect. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. All right, Brian. Well, thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>